am I going to lose my diagnosis of HEDS because I don't have this gene or this mutation? The one thing you'll say, it's not a collagen mutation, which is like totally obvious. And you're not, it's, we don't expect it to be a collagen mutation and it's not. Does the gene cover all of HEDS people? Hey guys, so today I am actually in South Carolina. I'm doing something really exciting, which is that I'm visiting Courtney and the Norris Lab. Courtney, why don't you give a little bit of an explanation about who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a PhD student at the Medical University of South Carolina, and I am working in the lab of Dr. Russell Norris, or Chip Norris, as he likes to be called. And I have been working on hypermobile EDS for my PhD research um, part-time for about two years initially, and then full-time for the last like year and a half. And it's been really exciting to do this research because I am an HEDS patient myself. And so the work is super important to me and there are really not any other labs out there dedicated to um, studying the genetics of the disease and the uh, biological consequences of those genetics. So um, we've been working on this and we have identified a candidate gene for H2DS, um, which is super exciting. And we're working through validating that biology and trying to understand how common this mutation is or mutations in this gene in general are in the larger EDS population. So, just to clarify, the title is not clickbait. There really is a gene that has been found that is going to describe the, basically it's the causative gene for certain people with HEDS. A bunch of people are not gonna have it, and some people will have it, but you do in fact have at least one family with HEDS and who has it? I just wanted to say, look forward to content over the next few weeks uh, about my experience going to the Norris Lab. I've just been, ha I've just had so much fun, and thank you so much for for inviting me down here. It has been amazing. She was supposed to be here sooner. I wanted yeah. her to be an intern this yeah. summer, um, which would have been awesome. But she also did get to talk to the interns in the lab, so we had a really cool HDS internship program. It has two weeks left, but. Uh, probably by the time you see a lot of it, um, it'll have ended. And we brought in interns with HDS themselves to come work on the project this summer. These are all undergrad students interested in going into medicine or research or genetic counseling and nursing um, to really help build the team of researchers and clinicians out there who understand the disease and um, have been a part of the discovery, which is really cool. Yeah. So why don't we get to answering some questions? Um, that you guys had and then just some other basic questions. Obviously, they cannot release the name of the gene right now. They totally will at some point, but the point is that they need to publish the paper first. Um, yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, he oh. Wants to oh. <laughs> oh, he wants to join. He, he wants to be in it. He has some stuff to say about HEDS. Yeah, what do you think? What do you, what do you say? What do you say? Okay, so let's go. And you can say that you can't answer this right now. Uh, and in that case, you guys can look forward to, to hearing the answer to these questions and learning so much more in a handful of months once they release the paper. Look forward to some really even more interesting content coming out on my channel. Okay. So we're also we're going to be linking both her first paper that's been that she released. It has nothing to do with the actual gene, but it's a great overview of HEDS, right? It's, it's really an all-encompassing review of everything HEDS from symptoms to genetics, biology, um, what we know, what we don't know. And it's been really helpful for people to be able to um, take this to their primary care provider or to other physicians um, to help them understand other aspects of the EDS that they might not be really seeing in their practice. We'll also leave um, some information below about how you can um, be a part of the study. Yeah. Can people with HEDS outside of the US participate in the research study? So as of right now, only people within the United States are able to enroll in our clinical registry. Um, unfortunately, that's not um, something that we have control over. That's a decision made by our IRB here at MSC. What ethnic backgrounds do the families have if you're allowed to answer? Um, so we're still looking into a lot of that information. When we receive patient data, it becomes de-identified while we do the genetics. So we actually have to go back and look at what we originally collected um, to figure out more of that information. So it's actually not something I have a full grasp on right now, um, and I don't want to relay information that isn't fully accurate um, across looking at everyone that we've identified. Yeah, but you will in the paper. That yeah, that will release. definitely be something that we'll be able to share, as well as information that we've collected on things like comorbidities and um, severity of symptoms and all of that other patient data too. Does the gene cover all of HEDS people? No. <laughs> so that's a question we get a lot. Um, HEDS has really challenged researchers for a long time um, in terms of finding a genetic cause. And that's likely because there are going to be multiple causes. We do not suspect that it is a one gene fits all type of situation. Um, there's going to be multiple genes and we aren't um, stopping just because we found a gene. Um, we are continuing to look for additional candidate genes and um, 
we, we want to find them all. That would be awesome. Yeah. Also, um, I will say a good comparison is that classical EDS is caused by COL581 mutations, COL582 mutations, and sometimes COL1A1 mutations. So while there probably will be some more mutations in HEDS, um, it's kind of like that. Some people are going to have one of them, some people are going to have another, and sometimes, and it's also possible that that could play a big role in distinguishing the different symptoms and possibly even comorbidities that people with HEDS have. Some people are very, very different than others, and it could just be due to very, very different things, but it could also be due to different mutations. So we'll Yeah, absolutely. See. We hope to look back later and see if certain phenotypes correlate with certain genotypes, so how symptoms might match up with the genetics, and um, who knows, that could even end up with you know different subtypes of HEDS down the road. Yeah, that would honestly be amazing. And will we be able to be tested for it soon? That's a really good question. Um, so I, I've i never found a gene for a disease before. <laughs> um, in my 25 years, I haven't done this before. Shocking, it's your first time. So I actually don't know how quickly genetic information translates to making it onto genetic panels. Um, obviously, publications are really important, and I don't know how quickly those companies will read those publications or be able to develop their technology to include that information. Um, that being said, I do anticipate that there will be a lot of pressure on these companies to include that information because as we know, the majority of people with EDS have HEDS. So it would be in their best interest to be able to include as many new potential markers as they can when that information is published. But at the same time, um, depending on how, I guess, easy or hard it is to test for a certain gene, um, different different companies, labs may not may decide to not include it even once it's out there. So for example, Invitae is a fantastic company. They do not test for classical like EDS. So you cannot get TNXB tested, which like is really unfortunate for people who actually have classical like EDS, um, whereas other labs do it and it's thousands of dollars. So it's possible this gene could be like that or it could be on every panel and really easy in a handful of years, right? Yeah, and one of our other goals honestly is finding ways to make testing even more accessible than genetic testing. So, you know, with our genetics, are we able to develop a simple blood test that your primary care provider can do in the office and send off to a lab that isn't genetic? Um, genetic testing is a huge barrier for a lot of patients. Insurance companies don't cover it, it's expensive, um, and it takes a while to get back. So working on ways of diagnosing that don't even require the genetic component um, would be a really awesome um, thing for us to be able to do. Yeah. So I think a really important question that people are asking us is, am I going to lose my diagnosis of HEDS because I don't have this gene or this mutation? And that's a really important question because, you know, when the 2017 criteria changed, people lost their diagnosis of HEDS. They weren't supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. But I know people According that, to I mean, the, Are you serious? Oh, yeah. I've seen, like, lots of stories of people saying they lost their diagnosis. Oh, wow. So people who had an HEDS diagnosis, you know, the doctor said they had it, and then the 2017 criteria came out, and they didn't check off enough boxes. But they literally say on there, like, you're not supposed to take away some of the diagnosis if they were diagnosed with the early criteria. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the issue, too, is that, you know, you people can make whatever well. statements you want, yeah. but that doesn't mean your doctor is following those guidelines. Yeah. So we do not want any patients to lose a diagnosis. And they definitely will. Because no, they absolutely will not. Um, I mean, it will be emphasized that this is a gene that represents X percent of the population with HEDS. It could literally be 1% or less and or it will, a little more. And it will be out there to test for. And it's great if people have that marker. But if you don't, that doesn't mean you don't have HEDS. And yeah. we want to make that very clear. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have the disease and your doctor surely should not take away your diagnosis um, from you for not uh, having that mutation. And even more so, if you have an HEDS diagnosis, is it necessary to maybe go back and get tested for this gene? It might not be if you don't want to. If your insurance company won't cover genetic testing, if it's too costly for you, if you already have a great care team in place, Getting tested for that mutation might not be super important at that time. Yeah, now to like find a cure. Yeah, that was gonna say. Now down the realm, if we find ways to target um, the consequences of that mutation, then absolutely it would become important. Yeah. But I anticipate that you know when we first come out with this information and this marker is available to test for, I don't think it's going to be important that every single person who has HES needs to go back and get tested if they're already receiving proper care until um, therapies or new treatments are available. Yeah, and I actually think, you know, let's say in 10 years we've found the 20 causes for HEDS. One of the biggest impacts I think will have on people's lives is early diagnosis. There are so many things that a lot of HEDS patients 
could have avoided throughout their life or done differently if they had known they had HES. So testing kids who are developing certain symptoms of it just to make sure that they do or don't have it can be a, had have a huge impact on their life later on down the road. So I think like, you know, we spoke with Camille. She had like a uh, Miss America at the dinner recently and she just had so much to say about how she really believes that an early diagnosis helped her a lot. The main thing I'll say is like, it can totally be discouraging to be watching this and be like, why can't Courtney just say the gene name? Um, they will totally tell you at some point there is in fact a gene. I can promise you that. And it's just they're not allowed to say it right now. And I can also say that even if I told you right now, um, it's not going to drastically change what you're doing, right? I mean, sure, I, I know that, you know, if you knew you had a mutation, it's very validating. And it's saying, you know, I definitely have this disease right. and it's real. And I know that's what people want is that tangible evidence right now. But it's not going to change the course of your care at this time. And I want people to keep that in mind. And also, um, you know, my research mentor, Dr. Norris, like, he is a phenomenal scientist. He has published in incredible journals and he has a very strong reputation in the scientific community. And we want our HEDS research to continue to follow down that path. So we want to publish in really high impact journals and we want to um, make sure that this information gets to the right place and is taken seriously by the scientific community. And part of that is making sure we validate every step of the way. And so that's why we are holding on to this genetic information and working as hard as we can to validate that so that we can publish in a really good journal to make a, a huge impact in the EDS community and in the connective tissue disease community in general. The one thing you'll say, it's not a collagen mutation, which is like totally obvious. And not, it's, we don't expect it to be a collagen mutation and it's not. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's not in a gene that's already been identified in EDS. It's not yeah. a collagen gene. It's not um, something obvious, which is why I think um, it's really been challenging to identify um, for years. And when it, when we first found it, it wasn't obvious either. So um, it's it's not something that's sitting right in front of you. Um, it's it's There's a reason why people, I think, have, have missed it for years. I also want to let you know that this video will be a fundraiser for the Norris Lab, so that way if anybody wants to donate, um, they can through this, it would be so helpful. I know that their lab needs a lot of funding and they're hoping to continue on with this research for more than just this one gene. They're looking at so many different things, which kind of um, brings me to the next thing, which is... Yeah, so um, a lot of people have asked if we're looking at comorbidities and we are very interested in that. We've been collecting that patient data with ev from everyone in our registry to know um, how they're affected. But beyond that, we are using our mouse model of HEDS. So this is a mouse that has the gene mutation that we identified. We were able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock that mutation into mouse, which is super cool. So we have little HEDS mice running around, um, and we're able to use those mice to study other things. So looking at things like mast cell activation syndrome and POTS and other comorbidities, um, we're very interested in sort of putting together the connection and how those are connected to HEDS. And, um, interns in the lab this summer are actually working on some of those things. So it's not just HEDS, it's all of the things that come with it too. Yeah, and just tell me to stop speaking if I can't say this, not cut it out, but like the mice, when you change this, they do develop an HEDS phenotype. So it seems like the mice have HEDS, which is just even more promising. So if the biology backs it up and the mouse model backs it up and the humans back it up, that's really promising. And they yeah. have done that. And, and so this mouse isn't just about studying what's going on. It's about having a platform that we can continue to use to test diagnostic approaches that aren't genetic testing, to um, eventually test treatment approaches. So when you want to study how a, a treatment or a drug can help a, a population with a disease, you have to start in an animal. And sometimes people are really stuck because they don't have an animal model for an illness. And so this is awesome that we have this model that we're going to be able to test things on and continue to move forward with our research. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that <laughs> this lab has been working so hard and I'm just so honored to be able to come here for the weekend and of the week, whatever, and come see it. So thank you so much, Courtney. And guys, please look forward to all the videos that I'm going to be releasing over the next few months. And Right when the paper publishes, there'll be even more videos. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bye.